nine bottles per minute. And to put that in perspective, the output of that machine in one day would have required 36 men and boys working for 18 hours blowing bottles by hand. High-speed filling and packing lines soon followed. The O in OI stands for Owens, and it's the legacy of his machine on which the company has built its global container business. It continues to produce billions of glass containers every year. Before the post-war era in the 1940s, glass and metal containers were the most common options available to store food. That is, until a man named Earl Tupper revolutionized food storage and preparation. Well, before Earl Tupper came along, uh, you know, this was still a time before most refrigerators, many people were still having ice delivered to their home. Food containers were basically designed to store for a day or so. In the 1940s, the plastic industry was still in its infancy. Plastic containers were difficult to market because they were known to be brittle, greasy, smelly, and generally unreliable. Therefore, Tupper developed two important innovations in plastic technology. Uh, he helped to develop the process of refining polyethylene slag. Uh, polyethylene slag is essentially this black substance uh, that is a byproduct of uh, oil refinement in the petroleum industry. Through this process, uh, he was able to develop a material that was very durable, that was flexible, great for food conservation. Uh, it was a material that was non-porous and uh, even uh, translucent. And he developed the Tupper Seal, an airtight and watertight lid modeled on a common hardware store item. He was in a hardware store one day and he saw a uh, paint can and he noticed that the paint can, you know, there was a seal in the center of the paint can. And he got the idea, if I made the seal go around the outer edges of a bowl, this would be compatible with a need that was uh, coming of age as people were buying refrigerators in the post-war years. The seal was able to um, seal in things like moisture so that the food did not dry out. It kept the food from wilting, basically um, maintained the, the overall taste and texture of the food as well for long-term conservation. With housewives demonstrating the revolutionary seal at Tupperware parties, sales skyrocketed. Soon everyone's macaroni and egg salads were kept fresh in Tupperware containers. Tupperware and other container manufacturers needed to develop new technology in the late 1970s when the microwave oven entered the kitchen. But it was the TV dinner container that would have to change the most. The conventional aluminum tray and the microwave oven were a particularly bad match. They didn't have anything inside the oven cavity to absorb the microwave energy. So if you put metal in, it reflected back to what we call the magnetron. That's what generates the microwaves. The waves would reflect back, heat it up, and burn it out. 1986 saw the first microwave oven safe plastic and paperboard containers. Today, about two billion meals in microwavable containers are sold annually in the United States. With technology changing the look and use of containers, designers constantly have to think outside of the box. In London, two developers have done just that. And now, people are living inside the box. Glass can be recycled an infinite number of times. Recycling just one glass bottle saves enough electricity to light a 100-watt bulb for four hours. Containers will return on Modern Marvels, here on the History Channel. We now return to Containers on Modern Marvels. Enough shipping containers exist on our planet to build an eight-foot-high wall around the equator, twice. For the containers that have completed their tour of duty at sea, a visionary group of developers have found a second life for them. Eldon Scott and Eric Reynolds of Urban Space Management built Container City in the heart of London's Docklands area. Container City looks... It looks like Lego bricks, sort of red, orange, and yellow bricks stacked on top of each other in a seemingly quite random style. And they have these little balconies, which uh, are also made of containers and uh, railings across the front. A container's final destination is usually the scrapyard. But these containers were destined for greater things. The cheapest form of construction is an existing box. 
which is what the container is. The container supplies, when you buy it, everything. It's got the floor, the walls, and the roof. Apart from that, they're very strong. They're quite capable of being put into quite funky arrangements. Scott and Reynolds converted the bulky cargo containers into comfortable live workspaces. When people hear that you live in a container, they, they, um, they think you're living in a drippy, awful, cold tin can. And um, they say, well, winter's coming. You're going to be terribly cold. I think, no, they're insulated. You know, we have electricity, we have running water. You know, it's actually very civilized. To keep costs low, the architects used 100% recycled materials. An international standard container is exactly that. They are precisely within a couple of millimeters, the same size at the corners, because all those coins join together. So that's a wonderful thing about building with them, of course, that um, you don't have the problem you do with, say, bricks or blocks, which come in slightly different sizes and you have to make it up with cement. Containers you know are going to be perfect, so you can buy them anywhere and they will work. It took five months to erect Container City One, which opened in May 2001 and provided 12 work studios. In 2003, another floor was added in less than two days that provided three additional live-work apartments. A total of 100 units now make up Container City. There was enough demand, and again to prove a point, that because these things are designed to stack, they literally pop on top of each other, we put another floor on it. A 300 square foot space, the size of one container, costs about $80 to $140 per month to rent. The success of Container City led to a boom in other container buildings for schools, hospitals, and sports centers. We have accidentally found ourselves actually running a business making these things that were initially for ourselves. Urban Space Management has gone global with their livable containers. They're making sales in South America, Pakistan, and Australia. However, they might have competition in Australia. There, architect Sean Godsell is turning shipping containers into emergency and relief housing for people who are displaced by disasters, like Hurricane Katrina. His concept, named Future Shack, is designed to be mass-produced, inexpensive, and easy to ship and stockpile. The shacks are completely self-contained and can be erected in 24 hours. The inside is lined with plywood walls that contain built-in furniture. There is also a separating wall that houses plumbing necessities. Gonsal added only a few exterior changes. Several additional slots used to secure the structure to a foundation, a top-hinged front opening for the entrance, and a series of operable panels in the roof for ventilation. Despite the alterations, the shack maintains its seaworthiness and its ability to be shipped anywhere in the world, just like its unmodified predecessor. Architects and city planners across the globe are taking note of these modular ideas. Homes, offices, studios, and vital infrastructure soon may be shipped into a neighborhood near you. After all, a good new container is never out of style. Stomping through history, he paused.